Before we talk about calculating the relative risk and odds ratio, let's look at the scenario that these are used for. These are used when we have a two by two contingency table. Two by two contingency tables can describe when we have two treatments or situations, and we want to know if they influence or are associated with the probabilities of two outcomes. That is, is the outcome contingent upon the treatment or situation, or is it independent of the treatment or situation? The first two in the two by two is the two treatments, and the second two is the two outcomes we're interested in. For example, say we have two treatments, A and B. The scenario we're interested in is how many observations or individuals end up in the first and second outcomes. We compare the numbers observed in these four categories to the numbers expected if the treatments and outcomes are independent of one another. If the observations and expectations are similar, the outcome is independent of treatment. But if the observations and expectations are different, the outcome is contingent on the treatment and there is a non-random relationship between the treatment and the outcome. The statistical question is how to determine whether any apparent relationship is truly non-random or maybe just looks that way due to sampling error and noise. We could use the chi-squared statistic or Fisher's exact test, the standard techniques for testing for independence in categories like this. If you're not familiar with these methods, the Stats Examples website and this channel have videos that talk about them. Unfortunately, these approaches have problems. First, the chi-squared has limited power with only four categories. Such tests have only one degree of freedom, and unless the sample sizes are very large, it's hard to detect non-random relationships. Second, the chi-squared value and the result from the Fisher's exact test are poor descriptive statistics. They show if something's non-random, but give no sense of what the non-random pattern or process may be. For these reasons, the relative risk and odds ratio approaches are much more common. The typical scenario is that we want to know whether individuals who possess a risk factor, or perform a risk behavior, are more or less likely to experience a particular outcome relative to those who don't. We look at the risk and non-risk groups separately and count how many observations or individuals end up in the category corresponding to the focal outcome and how many end up in the category representing the other outcome or outcomes. For example, let's think about lung cancer and smoking. We set this up with the risk factors as the rows and the outcomes we care about as the columns. The convention of using the letters A, B, C, and D to represent the numbers in each category is standard, but not universal. We'll be using these values as we continue in this video. Looking at our two groups, smokers, the risky behavior, and non-smokers, the non-risky behavior, we compare the number of people in each of the outcome groups, which are having lung cancer, the focal outcome, and not having lung cancer, the other outcome. Obviously, in this case, we expect that the ratios of A to B and C to D to be different, but how exactly do we calculate this? Our first way to measure the relationship between risk and outcome is by using the relative risk, often abbreviated as RR. The relative risk compares the proportions of individuals with the focal outcome in the two risk groups. The equation shows how this is done. The numerator calculates the proportion of individuals in the risk group who have the focal outcome, and the denominator calculates the proportion of individuals in the non-risk group who have the focal outcome. If the risk increases the occurrence of the focal outcome, then the numerator will be larger and the relative risk value will be larger than one. If the risk has nothing to do with the occurrence of the focal outcome, then the numerator and denominator would be similar, and the relative risk value will be approximately equal to 1. And if what we're calling the risk reduces the occurrence of the focal outcome, then the numerator will be smaller and the relative risk value will be less than 1. We can see here that the term risk isn't always something that we think increases the focal outcome. The relative risk idea can also be used to study factors or behaviors that we think may be protective. The relative risk is a nice statistic in that it's intuitive. An RR of 2 means that the risk of the focal outcome is double for individuals with the risk factor compared to those without the factor. Likewise, an RR of 1.5 would mean a 50% increase in risk, whereas an RR of 0.7 would mean a risk of only 70% compared to the non-risk group. Unfortunately, with many real-world cases, especially in medicine, we don't have actual values for B or D. If you think about a lot of medical studies, we probably have patients or subjects who show the focal outcome, and we can ask them about their risk factors to get A and C, but we don't have good data on everybody else to get B and D. On the bright side, the next statistic is easier to calculate with most real-world data. Our second way to measure the relationship between risk and outcome is by using the odds ratio, often abbreviated as OR. The odds ratio compares the proportions of the risk and non-risk individuals in the two outcome groups. The equation shows how this is done. The numerator calculates the ratio of the risk and non-risk individuals for the focal outcome groups, and the denominator calculates the ratio of the risk and non-risk individuals for the other outcome groups. If the individuals with the focal outcomes are more likely to have the risk factor than the individuals in the other outcome, 
then the numerator will be larger and the odds ratio value will be larger than 1. If the outcome has nothing to do with the ratios of the risk and non-risk individuals, then the numerator and denominator would be similar and the odds ratio value will be approximately equal to 1. And if the individuals with the focal outcomes are less likely to have the risk behavior than the individuals in the other outcome groups, then the numerator will be smaller and the odds ratio value will be less than 1. Unfortunately, the odds ratio is not intuitive. An OR of 2 does not mean that the risk of the focal outcome is double for individuals with the risk factor. The general concept that an OR value greater than 1 indicates that the risk is associated with more of the focal outcome, and that an odds ratio value less than 1 indicates that the risk is associated with less of the focal outcome is true, but the exact value can be very misleading. Despite the big difference between the meaning of the odds ratio value and the relative risk value, they're constantly confused with each other, even by working professionals. The reason why we use such an awkward statistic is because with many real world cases, we can get estimates of the fractions A divided by C and B divided by D by measuring the ratio of risky and non-risky behaviors in a sample of our focal outcome individuals and using a baseline ratio for the general population for the other outcome. This is done a lot in epidemiology and public health studies, which is where we see these statistics show up the most. The odds ratio has a couple of quirks we should be aware of. The first quirk relates to the point I just made about the relative risk and odds ratio being different. The odds ratio overestimates the relative risk, especially for common outcomes. The figure shows the proportion of the focal outcome on the x-axis. The y-axis shows the value of the odds ratio for five different relative risk values, 1.01, 1.05, 1.1, 1.5, and 2. When the focal outcome is rare, the values match. But as the focal outcome becomes common, the odds ratio increases, especially when the relative risk is more than 1.05. The downside of this is that if we calculate the odds ratio for focal outcomes that aren't super rare, then the odds ratio will tend to dramatically overestimate the relative risk. Keep in mind that for many types of data, the odds ratio is the only value we can calculate. But on the bright side, if we calculate the odds ratio for focal outcomes that are rare, then the odds ratio will give us a good estimate for the relative risk. In fact, there's an equation that relates these two values which allows us to estimate the relative risk from the odds ratio. The second quirk is that the odds ratio is invertible. If we switch the outcomes, the new odds ratio is the reciprocal, which is not true for relative risk. For example, if the odds ratio for the focal outcome is 4, the odds ratio for the other outcome would be 1 fourth. Likewise, if the odds ratio for the focal outcome is 0.333, then the odds ratio for the other outcome is 3. Let's take a moment to look at a quick summary of these two values before we introduce one more. We set up a grid with rows for the risk and non-risk factors, and columns for the focal outcome we care about, and another for the alternatives. The equations for relative risk and the odds ratio are straightforward fractions of fractions as shown. The relative risk is intuitive and easier to understand, but harder to get data for in the real world. The odds ratio values are unintuitive and can be misleading, but it's easier to get odds ratio data in the real world. The relative risk and odds ratio are roughly equal when the focal outcome is rare, and there is an equation we can use to relate these two values to each other. Let's look at a third statistic, the risk difference, often abbreviated as RD, before we talk about confidence intervals. Neither the relative risk or the odds ratio puts the value in context in terms of the absolute risk. Doubling a super small risk is less important than doubling a moderate risk. If your chance of dying from a disease if you perform a certain behavior goes from a baseline of 5% to 10%, that's much more important than if the risk goes from 1 in a million to 2 in a million. But both of these cases have relative risks of 2. The risk difference, also known as the excess risk or attributable risk, adds context by calculating the difference in risk in the two risk groups. From the equation, you can see that we're just calculating the overall proportion of individuals with the focal outcome in our two treatment, or behavior groups, and looking at the difference. Whenever we calculate descriptive statistics from sample data, we also want to calculate confidence intervals so we have a sense of what the population values are likely to be. It's therefore important to know how to calculate the confidence intervals for our relative risk, odds ratio, and risk difference values. For relative risk and odds ratio, you calculate confidence intervals for the natural log of the relative risk or odds ratio and then convert back via exponentiation with E. The equations for the standard error of the natural log of the relative risk and odds ratio values are shown. To use them, we transform our relative risk or odds ratio values by taking the natural log and then add or subtract the appropriate number of standard errors to create lower and upper bounds for the confidence interval with the degree of confidence we desire. 
For example, if we want 95% confidence intervals and have large sample sizes, we would typically add and subtract 1.96 of these standard errors to the transformed relative risk and odds ratio values to get the upper and lower bounds. Then we exponentiate these values to get back to the scale of the original relative risk or odds ratio values. For the risk difference value, the standard error is more straightforward and given by the equation shown. If we want a 95% confidence interval for our risk difference value and have large sample sizes, we would add and subtract 1.96 of these standard errors to the risk difference value to get the 95% confidence interval. There's a companion video on the channel and the stats examples website that walks through the step-by-step -step calculation of all of these values for several example data sets. If you want to see all the details of how to get relative risk, odds ratio, and risk difference values along with their confidence intervals. Now let's look at two examples of real world data. This first data set is used in tons of examples of the relative risk and odds ratio. It's an analysis of the difference in the chances of dying that men and women on the Titanic faced when it sunk in 1912. When the Titanic sunk, 154 of 462 women and 709 of 851 men died. A quick calculation reveals that this is 33% of the women and 83% of the men. You may be surprised to hear that most women actually survived the Titanic sinking, but you're probably less surprised to hear that most men did not. Let's look at these values using our three statistics. Our risk and outcome grid would look like this. The risk factor is male versus female, with male being the riskier of the two, and the outcomes are whether the individuals died or lived. The number who died will be our focal outcome, and we get the number for the other outcome by subtraction from the total number of men and women. The relative risk would be calculated using this equation, and we can see that we get a value of 2.499, indicating that the chance of dying for a male on the Titanic was about two and a half times as high as a female. The odds ratio is calculated using this equation, and we can see that we get a value of 9.986. It's a bit hard to wrap your head around what this means, but it says that the ratio of males to females was almost 10 times higher in the group that died than in the group that lived. This is a nice example of how the odds ratio can mislead us. It does not mean that men were 10 times more likely to die, that value was two and a half. The difference between these two values is so large because the focal outcome was not rare. More than half of all the individuals experienced the focal outcome of dying. The risk difference is calculated as shown and we can see that we get a value of 0.500, indicating that the chance of dying for a male on the Titanic was 50% higher than the risk for a female, 83% versus 33%. These are excellent descriptive statistics that tell a detailed story of the different risks faced by the men and women on the Titanic. But if we wanted to use these statistics to make inferences about the overall risks to all the men and women who were sailing on ships of this nature back in the early 1900s, we could use the data as a sample. If we do this, then it would make sense to calculate some confidence intervals. When we do this, we get the confidence intervals around each value as shown. Neither the relative risk or odds ratio confidence intervals include one, indicating that these values are significantly different from one, suggesting a genuinely increased risk of death on ships like these for men versus women. The fact that the risk difference confidence interval does not include zero means the same thing. If you look carefully, you can also see that the confidence intervals for the relative risk and odds ratio are slightly asymmetric with more width for values above the estimate than below. This asymmetry was introduced by the exponentiation we had to use, but the effect is usually fairly minor. For our second example, let's look at some data for lung cancer in the United States in the year 2020. We'll compare the probabilities of dying from lung cancer in a given year for individuals who are over age 70, our risk group, and those 70 and below, our non-risk group. Using data from the World Health Organization's Global Cancer Observatory, we can get numbers for individuals who died from lung cancer broken down by age group. The relative risk equation gives us a value of 12.127, indicating that the chance of dying from lung cancer in a given year is 12 times higher for people over the age of 70 than it is for those age 70 or less. The odds ratio equation gives us a value of 12.152, the ratio of those above 70 to those 70 and less was about 12 times higher in the lung cancer death group than in the group of individuals who didn't die from lung cancer. The difference between these two values is minimal because the focal outcome is fairly rare. Overall, only about two in a thousand people die from lung cancer each year. These values are also both huge, which makes it seem like being over 70 is a very serious risk factor for lung cancer. The risk difference gives a value of 0.00206, however, this indicates that the chance of dying from lung cancer for those over age 70 is only 0.2% higher than it is for those age 70 and below. Looking at the confidence intervals, we can see that the relative risk and odds ratio intervals don't include one, and the risk difference interval doesn't include zero. 
These indicate that all three values are significantly larger than the random expectation, and that the chance of dying from lung cancer is non-randomly associated with older age when this is measured by being older than 70 or not. Lastly, the 0.2% value is significant, but is it important? Obviously, it's useful to have this information, but is it really the kind of thing that would change behavior? You can't alter your aging process, and the actual increase in risk is only 0.2%, which is very low. This detection of a significant, but extremely small, effect is often achievable when we have huge sample sizes like we do for this case. When you get significant results, it's always important to also ask whether they are important. Let's wrap up by reviewing some important points. The relative risk has an easy interpretation. It means what we think it does. This is a great descriptive statistic. The odds ratio has a less intuitive interpretation. People aren't used to thinking about ratios of ratios. This statistic is not as easy to understand as the relative risk. The odds ratio is reported much more in the literature than the relative risk, but it's often highly misinterpreted. I've seen tons of examples where people calculate the odds ratio and then talk about it as if it's the relative risk. The odds ratio is always larger, sometimes much larger, than the relative risk unless the focal outcome proportion is small. If we only have ratio data for the outcomes, we can calculate the odds ratio, but not the relative risk. The risk difference puts things into context, which may be important when very large or small values of the relative risk or odds ratio make it look like something major is happening. Significant is not always the same as important. Whenever we get significant results, we have to ask if they're relevant. How would we use this result? Finally, an observed non-random association is not the same as causation. Just because two things we measure have a non-random relationship, that doesn't mean that one always causes the other directly. Maybe some third factor is responsible for each. Remember to calculate and use the relative risk and the odds ratio responsibly and, as always, there's a PDF of this overview slide on the Stats Examples website. Feel free to share this with anyone you know who's learning about relative risk and odds ratios, and subscribe if you want to easily find Stats Examples videos in the future.